Are we live? Oh, it says live. I think we're live. Yeah. <laughs> Hola. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mari. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Zuzi Martin Lynch, and I'm going to read a few things to you. We're so excited to join us. We have people from all over that have uh, sent us messages telling us they're excited to hear this conversation between two Cuban American girls, one here in Miami and one in Cuba. So, Thanks for joining us for our fifth Cuba Hangout. On every first Friday of the month, we've been exploring relevant and popular Cuba-related topics through conversations with a variety of fantastic speakers and members of our community. So forgive me for reading this script, but I couldn't memorize it all because I'm a documentary filmmaker, not an actress, so I can't memorize it all. Uh -huh. uh, our goal is to add meaningful content to a complicated and often very misrepresented topic, Cuba and US-Cuba relations. This ongoing series is brought to you by Cuba One Foundation and Cuba Educational Travel. The Cuba One Foundation offers a new generation of Cuban Americans the opportunity to give back to Cuba, build relationships with the Cuban people, and explore its heritage through high impact trips to the island. Cuba Educational Travel is a leading organization in connecting the people of the US and Cuba through travel. CET offers cultural, educational, and luxury travel to Cuba, working with clients to develop unique, customized, and curated experiences on the island. Again, my name is Zuzi Martin Lynch, and I'm a Cuban American filmmaker, writer, and producer who was born and raised a good little Cuban girl in New Jersey in Elizabeth, New Jersey, raised by my grandparents. I lived in San Francisco for many years and now have very recently finally flocked to the Cuban American motherland of Miami. <laughs> I've never lived here before. So um, I never went to Cuba uh, until very recently and it was after I made my documentary film called Craving Cuba, which explored the complicated relationship we're talking about today um, uh, between Cuba and Cuban and, and America and Cuban Americans. Um, so the documentary explores bicultural identity and also, uh, besides Cuba, it talks about what it means to become American when you're raised by your abuelos. Um, so making the film, everything has changed, including leading me to this moment in time right now where I'm interviewing Mari. Uh, Marisa is a Cuban-American blogger and owner of a travel consulting firm based in Cuba. She brings a unique perspective into the socioeconomic structure of present yeah. and subsequently her brand, Marimundo, has made her one of the top bloggers in Cuba and a marketing influ influencer on the island. In 2015, she created her travel consulting firm that runs immersive and cultural experiences in Cuba that focuses on the distinctive political and economic traits of the country. So that's a little bit about both of us. And um, I'm so excited to be talking to you today and to ask you some really exciting questions, hopefully, and to also get to know you a bit more. So um, I sent Mari my questions, but we haven't talked about them because we wanted them to be fresh. So no, I, I haven't prepared very well. So. Oh, good. <laughs> so, and and I, I totally feel like talking to you in Spanish, but we are doing this interview in English. Si te sale el español, que te salga. A mí también, ¿ok? Está bien, está bien. Spanish comes out, it'll come out. Spanglish, um, ¿no? <laughs> Spanglish, exacto. Um, I thought it would be fun to start out by sharing with everyone that's watching um, about a little bit about when and how we met. Can you can you share your memory of how we met and <laughs> where? <laughs> uh, well, it was we met at, on a stage at the Google party, uh, the Google clandestina party. We met on stage where the DJ was in front of like, I don't even know how many, it probably was a thousand kids that were in that party, right? And I think it was 2,000 people, 2,000 It was insane. It, and uh, one of the people from Google recognized me and she was like, come on stage, come on stage. And so I went on stage. And I met you there, and we just started talking. And I'm like, ah, I'm Cuban American, Cuban American. Ah. But I have been living in Cuba, and I'm living in Cuba, and you're living in New York. And I said, we should do an interview together. And that's how we met on stage. So weird. But it was uh, an amazing night, one of the best parties in Cuba. Yes. Um, 
I just have to say that that moment was so historic and so it will it will forever be in my mind because here we were at a moment of transition for the island and we're at a Google Clandestina. Clandestina is the first private fashion label in Cuba. Google has just sponsored their their second um, fashion show and we were partying on a stage and then um, Daniel from Cuba One later on he said to me, hey Zizi, I want you to interview someone on one of our hangouts and I immediately was like, I want to interview Mari because I didn't even say more than you know 20 words to you because it was so loud but i had an immediate connection with you and that's that's what my relationship with Cuba is now it's, it's very different um from a few years ago it's going and meeting people that i have a connection with because like in other parts of life you're going to have people that you connect with and you're going to have people you don't connect with so i was immediately connected to you and i'm so happy to be talking to you um me too i was it was like a spark Yes, yes. Okay, so my next question. You have over 20,000 followers on Instagram, uh, something a lot of people over here pay for. <laughs> uh, you, gorgeous, gorgeous photography and a super strong voice, Mari. Uh, today I really want to talk to you about voice because it's a very important topic to me. Um, how did you find your voice? I think... Um for me, it was the the endless struggle between um, coming, you know, living in Cuba and going to visit the United States uh, regularly um, because my mom lives in the United States. And when I first started my Instagram, I just started posting things uh, of my family, my reality, my perspective here in Cuba, and. Through that, I really tried to show something different because up to that point, um, the propaganda of the, the island was always cars, mojitos, uh, salsa, music, and this whole like romanticized idea of what Cuba was. And so I wanted to say something a little different. And that's when I tried to find a voice that was different, that was real, but it was also mine. So even though it might not be the truth, because there's various amounts of truth, it was still my voice and and I could express that to the world. And it's really that's really important in Cuba today is that every individual now has a, a power to tell their story. So that's what I tried to do. Um, just today you had a very, beautiful post and introspective post um, where the photography is gorgeous, but you go into a vulnerable place where you talk about it being scary sometimes, you needing encouragement. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't send you this question, but I, I, I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by, by feeling, like I could sense your vulnerability in that message on Instagram today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, a lot of the times I have to, uh, censor what I say. I have to be very uh, one side, I have to be in the middle. So when I meant by scary, it was because I can't really 100% tell everything that I'm feeling because I have to be mindful of where I am, the culture of where I am, the mindset of many people of where I am. And so that's what I meant by scary. It's also scary to put yourself out there for people to judge you and uh, when I first started my Instagram, I, you know, I never wanted to be an influencer. This is, I mean, it's not my goal whatsoever to be an influencer. So, you know, and it put me in this place where I'm not usually in. I'm not comfortable and being the spotlight. I'm not, you know, that's not me in person. So, um, being in this position now, it's scary, and that's it, you know to be judged, to be looked on, to be called this, to be called that. And so, um, so that's what I meant by by that. And I tried to explain a little bit more in the in the comment. Oh, I can relate to that. Um, so it's it's nice to know sometimes that other people feel the same way you do, because a lot of people will see you as being someone that's very brave. And they might not have a voice, but when they know that you're even a little scared sometimes, then that gives them encouragement to take that step forward. So thank you. Oh, thank you. 
What what does voice mean to you, and why do you think it's important to give voice to Cuba today? You know, voice means to me just having ownership of my mind and my and and my thoughts. That's what voice is, and it's extremely important in Cuba today to have that ownership in voice and in opinions and in thoughts and in your mind. And something that I feel as a Cuban American that is not completely free here in Cuba. And so with the power of the internet, the internet has allowed people to express themselves in ways that they couldn't ever before. And, you know, like I said before, the, the government us usually had the propaganda of what Cuba was. And now you see that human experience being individualized through the internet, through voice. And that's what's so important to me is that I'm able to say what I feel in a delicate way and to the public and my realities here and trying to normalize a country that's very politicized because there is a normal there's a, a normal everyday life here that has nothing to do with politics and um you know trying to balance the two extremes together and within that i found my family importance and and you know and, and and sharing that voice or sharing that power to other people as well. Thank you. It, it's so interesting because um, in a very different way, um, my next question relates to that. Um, for me, the hardest thing in life was historically accepting disapproval or at least like, um, you know, from my family or, or not letting it bother me if if they didn't approve of something I, I did. Even... Uh, I mean, like I told you, I was a good little Cuban girl, but when I decided to make the film, um, you know, it was hard because some people didn't understand why I was doing it. And, and then later, they, when they watched it, they understood. But can you share with us if, if you felt disapproval on your journey, um, you know, from your family or, or from others and how you deal with it? Um, I don't really feel disapproval from my family so much because I have a little bit of a different Cuban American uh, story, but um, I feel disapproval from the Cuban American population in general. They think that I'm nuts. They think I'm crazy living in Cuba when I have the opportunity to live in the United States. Um, every day I'm either a communist or I'm a capitalist. <laughs> And, you know, I can never make anyone happy, either side happy. And, you know, it's not so much with my family, but it's with the Cuban American um, group in general that I feel a lot of disapproval, a lot of, like, judgment towards my decisions. Well, not this one. <laughs> not a lot. Not, not everyone. But no, but I know. Sometimes just getting disapproval from one person or a group of people that may not fully understand why you're doing it um, can be very difficult, you know, and I think these days it's hard to be in the middle politically here, even in the United States, it's, it's difficult to be independent or to be in the middle, which uh, shows a place of empathy, actually, because even if you don't agree with this side or this side, you understand, and that's why you're in the middle, so you can make your own decisions and choose your own journey, so I get it. Yeah. Um, uh, tell us about Okay, so the positive connections with the Cuban Americans, friends. Tell us um, how, tell us about your relationships with your Cuban American friends living here in Miami and other places and how we're the same as our Cuban counterparts and how we're different. Oh man, okay. <laughs> uh, well, in Cuba, first of all, many Cubans will not consider you Cuban, so you're yeah. American. I got, I got that when I went to Cuba and it was so weird because my whole life I was, I grew up in New Jersey, so everybody's from somewhere else, first generation. So when people ask you what you are, they don't mean like, are you from New Jersey? They mean like, where are your parents from? So I grew up, right. <laughs> Cubana, so Cubana. <laughs> because my grandparents raised me, like I'm totally Cuban in my mind. But then when I started traveling, people would say, oh, what part are of the island, you know? And then when I went to Cuba, they looked at me like I was crazy when I said that. They were like, I don't know Ghana, I don't know and, you know, They wanted to place me on like all other parts of the world. And I was like, 100%, 100%. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, so, it, you know, 
it's it's the same thing here. I mean, many Cubans are like, uh, "You're Cuban American. What does that mean?" Like, they don't even know what that means. Um, but if you're not from here, you're not. If you're not born here, you're not Cuban. So that's a big, big uh, difference between the perception of what is Cuban and what is not Cuban, right? But I think something that we all share together is that we have a history. We know the same history together. We are we have the same passion about a place, um, and we can't we we know about the same cultural identities as one another, and that's what binds us together. Even though they they might view you as not being from Cuba, you still have that identity that I think that they will see once they get to know you more than a regular other American. So that's the, like the similarities are there. It's harder to discover while you're in Cuba because you start feeling like the other, right? I'm sure you have uh, experienced no. that. Yeah, I mean, a few, before I went to Cuba, if somebody told me I wasn't Cuban, I, I would have maybe been offended, you know, because I'm, I think about my grandparents that are still alive and all the, you know, all the customs and the language and everything else. However, you know, going there, I, I understand. And I think it's not just Cuban, like anyone who is raised, born here in the United States with, with really strong cultural ties, no matter what country they're from, is gonna have this identity crisis where they have such a deep rooted culture in, in, imposed on them by their family and, and grandparents and their cousins. But we're also so American. I mean, that's the one big realization I had at the end of my film. I was like, are we allowed to say coño? Well, I was like, coño, I'm American. <laughs> I'm totally American. <laughs> but I didn't really think about it that way before. And, you know, people might think I sound American because I don't you know how I'm speaking. But when I speak Spanish, I'm fluent in Spanish also, you know. So it's, it's interesting. And I don't think anyone should be offended. I think they should just understand why, why it's being said. And, and Cuban friends in Cuba can also understand the perspective of, of where we're coming from, right? Like feeling like this passion for a... They, for they, a you know, yeah. they, they still consider you family. You still have that same root, the same history. Just this, the, the thinking is a little bit different. So, but it's still there. You know, you're still family, eres familia. Me entiende tu primo, tu prima. Todos son familia. But uh, they don't accept, right? Or uh, but you're from Aya, Aya es eh, los Estados Unidos. So you have the differences, but on the foundation, I feel like there's many things in common we both share as Cubans and Cuban Americans. Yeah. Again, um, I, we have a couple more questions, but uh, let, let me get through the questions. If we have more time, I'll, I'll comment okay. on. Them. Um, what is the hardest, since I'm an optimist, I'm going to say, what's the hardest thing about living in Cuba today? And what has you most excited? Well, the, the hardest thing about living in, living in Cuba, and I think it's particularly harder for me because I have lived in the United States, um, is the shortages of food, which and the shortages of everything that there are in Cuba. And I, I say that meaning day-to-day -day life. So when I go into a market, every single market is different. Every single market has different products and they don't have everything. None of the markets all have everything. So in a day-to-day -day perspective, that's the hardest thing to live on the island is that there's, you know, you have to struggle getting things that would have normally not been ever a struggle uh, 90 miles north. So. So on a day-to-day -day perspective, that's the hardest. In general, the hardest for me, um, and I guess the saddest for me too, is seeing, you know, the country with potential. And uh, it's there, it's there. And, you, and I see it, I see what it could be, you know, because it looks so much like um, Miami Beach. It looks so much like it in certain parts. And I see it there, and it's it, it hasn't yet progressed. So that's the hardest thing for me to see. It's, and the people too, you know, they work so hard, and they haven't been able to progress in life. You know, you were born one way, and you die one way, and that's the life for many Cubans. 
Um, but with that comes the most exciting parts because some Cubans are breaking that. Uh, you see many Cubans in Havana, but in particularly, who come from places in more impoverished places, and they, you know, make a they try to make a living, and they've done successful things in the arts, and and in you know movies and things like that, and they have been able to progress. And there are new things that are happening here in Cuba. Also, the most exciting thing because of the new things that are happening here in Cuba people are starting to think differently. Um, sorry, I left my phone. I left my phone. Um, and so when people start thinking differently, like, Susie, I'm telling you, if you would have asked me 10 years ago if people were publicly dissenting, and when I mean publicly dissenting, I mean uh, saying things bad things about the government to someone that just met, I would have told you that would have been, you know, no one would do that. And now you start seeing it more and more and more. I'm, you know, people are starting to, to think different things, say different things in public, record different things. This is going to change everything here. And so, you know, that would have never happened. So that's really exciting to see. Um, in terms of uh, social media, it's also really exciting to see Instagram grow with all these other, in, well, they say influencer influencers. So that's also say, really how exciting. You, how do you say that in Spanish? In, how, influence. No, se llama influencer también. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, with the sadness also comes opportunity to see things in a different light and see things progressing in in terms of uh, how the society views things nowadays. So speaking of cell phones, how do you think, what's your vision for Cuba in the, in the post 3G plus age and hopefully uh, 5G soon? <laughs> uh, well, 5G, I don't know about 5G. <laughs> <laughs> if 5G is just coming to America, wait 20 more years and then we'll have 5G. <laughs> we, can make, we can speed it up, we can speed it up. <laughs> Uh, well, in, ter in terms of that, I think, um, you know, Cubans on the island are very uh, non-political. They're very apathetic. And that's for many different reasons. And, but I see a lot of people start their YouTube channels, start their Instagram with fashion. You already see that happening, you know, the fashion and the models and all of that. So that's what I see um, in terms of, like, that sort of uh, social media things going on. Um, but my vision for Cuba is that it keeps progressing socially. We just had our first protest here in Cuba with signs. Did wow. you know about that? Uh, I, I did hear about it. Tell me your perspective. It was about animal rights, which is definitely needed. But I thought... The first one could have been something more substantial. Hey, a lot of people. It, but it's good. <laughs> the animal rights activists here would, would disagree, but yes. To, I know. But you know what I mean? Feel? Like, how did it feel? Because, like, I, I grew up in a super conservative family, and then I lived in San Francisco for many years, and I, I fully uh, support one's right to protest, but I physically feel uncomfortable holding a sign. Like, I will admit that. Like, because of how I was raised, like, Something I don't feel comfortable with, but I will support causes that, that are dear to me. How did it feel to like, I feel like you have to be really brave to, to get up there and, and protest. Like, how did that feel? Did you participate? No, I didn't participate and I didn't really know about it until after it was finished. But I would think that most Cubans would shy away from that, even if it's about animals. And uh, just because they don't want any problems, because it comes with a lot of problems if you say something wrong or you do something wrong. So um, I think they, I, I wish I would have been there because I wanted to, would have interviewed people about it. But um, uh, yeah, I think most Cubans wouldn't participate to be honest with you. But I think it's exciting that it actually happened. It's the first protest with signs. I mean, that didn't happen that is two exciting. weeks ago. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. Um, I want to. I have a couple more questions, but I wanted to give you. Do you have any questions for me? I wanted to see if you had any anything you wanted to ask. 
Yeah. Uh, so when, when was the first time? I maybe you have said this in the beginning, but the connection for me was a little uh, off. When was the first time you came to Cuba? So I um, I made so I made the film Craving Cuba because I I wanted to bring my abuela to Cuba with me. And uh, I also, again, was exploring like what it means to become American and this, this like, complicated relationship, right? It was, I, I decided to make it uh, a month after President Obama announced he wanted to nor normalize relations with Cuba because I started wondering like, what does this mean for me? Um, so the whole part of the journey was me trying to convince Abuela to come. And at the end of the day, she didn't come. Se puso nerviosa, you know, she almost she was not, you know, had to go to the doctor. Like she didn't give me the interview and she didn't come to Cuba. So I had to decide whether I was going to go or not. And it was really, really hard for me to go to decide because I was raised, you're never going to go there. So it, but I'm, I was an adult and I wanted to go because it, it's such a big part of me. So at the end of the day, politics aside, I didn't think anyone had the right to tell me where I could go, where I couldn't go. And that's, that's a very like, that's the way I was raised in New York. Like you could do anything, you know, go for it. So I, I went, but it was very heavy. So I went uh, in the summer of 2015, so about eight months, nine months after they, they started to normalize yeah. relations. And, and that was very heavy. I felt like a tourist. I paid $5 and was literally on a bus with uh, with uh, Brit, Brit, British people, tourists. However, I realized that like it was the, the least, the, the most poorly planned part of the whole documentary, and it was very emotional. So I knew that was circumstantial. So I hope that if that happens to anyone, ever, anyone out there, that they will truly not do it the way I did it, and they will give it a chance. Because I went when I came back uh, in San Francisco, I started to become invited to I was invited to to meet different people that were visiting Silicon Valley. Um, anything that was Cuba related, I was like a magnet. They started me inviting me and I met many, many incredible people. And then I went back the following summer uh, with a group of people, including a reporter, a Cuban American reporter from the Bay Area. And, and then I, I met friends. And then the third time I went was when I heard, uh, well, I was invited to go to the Google party. Uh, and I mean, like my middle name is Pachanga. However, I was going for like, I thought it was such a historic moment. And I already said it for me. So for me, it started changing when, when I met people like you, when I met people, uh, other other friends that I had there, where I felt that connection. It wasn't about the past anymore, um, per se, although that's always always a part of me. It's, it's a part of the future and today and, and creating with people that think the same way you do or or can help you create something that's more beautiful than you could have ever imagined. So I've been three times now, the first time heavy, the second time a little better, the third time awesome. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize that you only had been three times. That's yeah, I know. You, right? you have to come again. Yes, I, <laughs> I want to come again and I want to hang out with you, uh, maybe on a stage, but somewhere where we can also talk. <laughs> yes. Um, one one question for you is when you first came and you were walking the streets or I know you were with a tour group. Um, no, I was by myself with my cameraman and my director of photography. Uh, uh, okay, and and there was no tour group, so I was I was literally wandering. It, it was terrible. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, like you I mean, me, I, I didn't plan it. It was bad. I didn't. It wasn't that Cuba was terrible. It just, you know, it's like getting to any country and feeling like a complete tourist. Mm -hmm. you know, people actually thought I was the translator because I looked Latino and the other two guys were not or, or didn't look it. So they thought I was just the translator working with them. When I was like, hello, I'm the director. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but when you were walking the streets, the first day or two days that you were there, did you look in it in a perspective of what your parents had told you for many years? Uh, when I when I was landing, before I touched down, all I could think about were the stories of my dad talking to me on, about his time on the finca, and my mom talking to me about her abuelito, 
uh, and her childhood. Like I was thinking about how they felt leaving, leaving the island. Uh, and, and I was thinking like, here I am uh, arriving and I was trying to imagine how scared and, and sad they were when they left, you know? Um, so when I was actually on the ground, I was just overwhelmed. I couldn't believe the streets were so loud. And I mean, granted, there was a lot of buildings falling down, a lot restored in certain areas, but I couldn't believe how beautiful and big. Like it felt like I was in, in another part of the world, certainly not so close to the United States or Miami. Right, right. But I'm asking that because a lot of Cuban Americans do come for the first time and they feel bad right they feel um guilty sort sort of um so when i tell cuban americans on my instagram that haven't, haven't been here yet to cuba i always encourage them to come and not feel bad but to engage with people so that the, the ideas flow together and we can grow together because if you can't change a country or want change in a country if you don't talk to each other right and so I ask that because a lot of the Cuban Americans just have this political curtain when they come and they try and then they look in, in that curtain. But I always encourage people to take the curtain down and come and see for what it is. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of um, a lot of the Cuban Americans, the way I was brought up is, is um, comes from a place of pain, either their own pain or their family's pain. Um, you, you build like a shell around it to protect yourself, you know? So I, I think it's important for people to, to express themselves and to also honor that experience, you know? And then be open to, to having real conversations with people they meet. And again, you're gonna meet people that you don't care for and you're gonna meet people that you feel it's your your cousin like right away so that's that's what i tell people and and i feel like if we just respect each other then we can move forward and, and absolutely okay i think we ran out of time i think I so too to they're telling us to, to leave okay <laughs> mari un besote gracias por todo to you, okay eh? un abrazo un abrazo y nos vamos a ver pronto okay sí mama bueno Chao, gracias por todo. Bye.